Hello everyone and welcome back to the data science webinar series organized by Manav, the Human Atlas Initiative. My name is Chavi and I would start by mentioning that if you all have questions during the talk, please write them in the Q&A tab below. I repeat, please only use the Q&A tab to write and ask questions. So today we have once again with us Dr. Pranay Goyal. He is joining us from Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research in Pune. Dr. Pranay is a data science expert and uses mathematical models to study diseases. Those of you who attended his talk last week would remember that Dr. Pranay introduced us to how scientists use mathematical concepts to understand the intensity of an outbreak such as COVID-19. We learned what is R0, how to calculate it, and saw some interesting simulations. I'm eagerly looking forward to what Dr. Pranay has for us today. To start with, Dr. Pranay has agreed to take a few questions from the last week's session. So welcome, Dr. Pranay. Hello. Hello, can you hear me? Hi, thank you, Chavi. Thank yeah. you, Manav. Hello, sir. Uh, let me just, yeah. Uh, yeah, I can hear you. Great. Uh, so the first question, Dr. Pranay, was from a student who wanted to understand whether R0 and beta are the same. Okay, so R0 and beta are not the same. Uh, beta, if you, uh, if you look at it, is the transmittivity of passing from the susceptible pool to the infected pool. In other words, if a population is susceptible and there is a rate at which people get infected, that is essentially what beta is. Okay. Let me share uh, my slides. Uh, I will uh, describe the equations to you again uh, somewhat uh, carefully. Uh, and what I want, sorry, let me look for my share screen. I think it'll be easiest if I show it to you with this respect to the model. Yeah. Okay, so I hope you can see, uh, see my slides. Yes. Okay, great. Let's move on to the position where we right here. Okay, so let's take a look at the SIR model. Now, uh, what beta corresponds to is the rate at which susceptible people come into contact with infectious people and turn infection, infected. Okay, that's what beta is. But imagine, but ask yourself, how does the infected people? How do uh, how does the pool of infected people change? The pool of infected people changes from susceptible people becoming infected. But it also changes because infected people actually recover. So you have to take into account, if you want to count the number of susceptible people there are at a given time, you have to count the factors that influence people getting infected, but you also have to take into account people getting recovered. So you have to take both of those factors into account. And it turns out that R0 is actually the ratio of at which people get infected, that's beta, and uh, divided by the ratio, by uh, sorry, it's the ratio of people uh, of beta, uh, which is transmittivity, which is the infectivity, and divided by gamma, which is the rate at which people are getting uh, recovered. So, in fact, uh, think of R naught as the rate of infectivity relative to the time scale at which people are recovering. Does that answer the question? That's R naught. Yeah, I think that answers the question. And I think it also partially answers the next question, which was what variables affect the change of R0? So right. I've been, yeah. So I think the second question uh, also uh, gets its answer from this equation. The third and the last question uh, for now is does R0 depend on secondary infections as well? Uh, as in, if a person infects X and Y and X later infects five others, Will R not consider the other five people as well? Okay, so the answer is uh, embedded in the process itself. So the rate, the, the process by which an infection spreads is one person, say, infecting two, two infecting four, and four infecting eight. So it grows geometrically. Each person infects two, assume, then R not will be two, but the expansion of the I population will be 2, 4, 8, 16. That is what grows geometrically. Does that answer it? Yeah, I think I'm sure that makes it very clear. So now over to you, Dr. Pranam. Okay, great. So what we are going to do uh, today 
today is going to be a sort of hands on session uh, in the sense that i am going to talk to you about how to compute r0 from case incidence data so this is going to be very much uh, so last time was a little bit abstract it was theoretical but i needed it to set the stage for how r0 is actually calculated what we're going to do today is i'm going to describe three ways in which r0 can actually be calculated from data the and, they, and we will discuss why it is important to calculate data uh, sorry calculate r0 from the data when should you use the data to calculate r0 uh, and there'll be some interesting answers to these questions uh, calculating r0 as we had discussed last time uh, often occurs early in the spread of an epidemic because if r0 is known to be greater than 1 then you can declare it a pandemic essentially you know that this is going to la largely spread very rapidly because it's going to multiply instead of having a few cases which then decay uh, if r0 is greater than 1 that threshold condition you know that this is going to spread in the population and then you have to all sorts of measures have to be put into place uh, in order to be able to uh, mount a response to the pandemic okay so knowing an r0 has that very uh useful uh, i mean it has that utility okay so the question then is well how soon should you start to calculate r0 and uh, you know more importantly if you how how much can you trust your r0 if there are going to be uncertainties in your r0 calculation uh, can you um, can you get a um, can you get a sense of what the uncertainty is uncertainty is where it is coming from uh, and so those are the kinds of questions uh, we will be discussing in uh, detail over here okay what i'm going to do is i'm going to show you some data that is collected uh, from italy italy is you know is one of the great uh, hotspots of uh, the corona virus so i actually went online and i uh, downloaded uh, so you know the data aggregator uh websites uh, including johns hopkins who and other places which have done a very good job of uh, you know making this david data available so i'm going to actually uh, i actually did it last night i downloaded some of this data from the case uh, cases that were being reported in italy and we're going to use that as a data set for uh, computing r0 uh, presently so let's get into it uh, so i also want to say that uh, i will start by reviewing the sir model just a little bit uh, to answer the question uh, r0 whether how can you influence it this question will come up again uh, clearly if you try to reduce b by you can't do much about the way the disease progresses you know that's a function of biology that's a very complicated function of biology it's much about uh, the um, uh, the gamma that's there in the denominator but the numerator you can spread that's a social phenomenon that's how uh, the virus transmits itself in a population the, how, that's how the virus spreads in a population remember that uh, you know a susceptible person has to come in contact with an infected person in order for the virus to spread what if you could uh, if you could reduce the the rate at which susceptible people come in contact with infected people uh, that might that would change beta in a sense that would uh, put a factor in front of beta the beta si term and that would change r0 so we will also see in the italy data uh, after the lockdown was there any difference in uh, in r0 okay uh, from from uh, you know from saying that you know we we've, uh, we've uh, had social distancing in place we've got people separated from each other that should reduce the transmissibility so we'll take a look at that as well in the data whether that actually makes any difference uh, and what is the data set okay so let's start i'm going to start with the review of the sir model just a very quick recap uh, <clears throat> uh, let me remind you that these equations are only prototypical of what we will use the sir model uh, is not the only one that we will use in fact uh, there are many other models that have been used uh, and i will mention a few towards the end but these are all compartmental models then uh, framework for considering these things for in which this sir model is embedded is to think of these as compartmental models the compartmental model has a certain has certain features and let's discuss those features as well as we go through the equations 
So uh, let's take this equation ds by dt is beta times i times s divided by n. So this is an expression of the law of mass action essentially. Think of this as a chemical reaction. The same kinds of reactions that you would be a reaction equation that you would write for the rate of one chemical reacting with another. It's pretty much those equations over here, right? So you notice in particular that you know uh, the rate at which s changes is proportional to the product of i times s. The product signifying that the, a susceptible person has to be uh, uh, in, in contact with an infected person. So you need both of the susceptible person the susceptible pool and the infected pool if the if there is no infected pool for example if the i is zero then there won't be any transmission if there is no susceptible person uh, then there is no transmission so you need both of them together and that's what this product essentially is uh, so the more the s is there the you know the greater the rate at which s changes the more infected people there are that the greater the rate at which um, s changes negatively but that's the you know the number of people will decrease very rapidly if there are more infected people and so on. So mm, ds by dt is proportional to both i and s, and in fact, it's proportional to the product of them. Okay, so that's how you would write that equation. Now you write very similar equations for di by dt, which is essentially whatever flux is coming from the susceptible pool to the infected pool is the is the flux received by the susceptible pool as well, and then the flux going from the infected to the recovered is gamma times i. It depends only on i. In fact, it is proportional to the i. So the more infected people there are, there is a, the, more, the greater is the rate at which that pool is decreasing, that the greater is the rate at which they're recovering, right? Okay, so the, these equations are essentially the law of mass action. And this last equation is a constraint because at the rate, at, because at the time scale at which this is spreading, uh, you, 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 you think of this as a closed form. There is one very important assumption that goes into it, apart from the fact that we've not considered other states. You've not considered in this model, we've not considered in this model, for example, uh, a state where people are uh, infected, don't show any symptoms. You don't consider in this model asymptomatics, which means people show a very, they don't show uh, overt uh, symptoms, even though they are infected and so on and so forth, right? So there's many, many different compartments, many, many com different compartmental models that people consider. And it's not completely clear right at the beginning, which one would be the most appropriate model to use. Nonetheless, some uh, aspect of, uh, of, uh, uh, some you know you by uh, by seeing what the how the, the virus is spreading uh, how the epidemic spreading you start to get a sense of you know how the epidemic is being in a population uh, and so for example you might decide to include a quarantine compartment SIQR model a quarantine compa compartment to reflect the fact that you know people uh, with a very severe case of the disease have been uh, quarantined for example okay so I will pause a little bit to allow for a few questions to come in at the moment. And if there aren't any, I will move on. So Chavi, could you please take a look if there are any questions at this point? We don't have any questions so far, Dr. Goyal. So I think okay, so let's continue then. Uh, so uh, especially for this talk, for the second part, I would encourage people to post their questions if they have any so that uh, I can go back and uh, revisit some of the things that I'm describing because in a minute I'm going to switch to um, to software and I'll be sharing my screen with you and I'll be working out those numbers for you um, on my laptop uh, so I can imagine that some of you will want some of these steps to be repeated if you need please let me know okay so uh, remember that we said that the R0 is beta over gamma uh, let's take a closer look at the equation for the spread of the infection. That's just this previous equation written down, but instead of beta being over here, I'm going to divide by beta, uh, by sorry, by gamma, and I'm going to pull out a gamma, and then this beta over gamma that I pull out, that will be R0. So I'm going to recast this equation with a small amount of algebra into an equation that that recasts the I equation in terms of R0. Essentially, di by dt is R0 times 
S by N. S by N is the fraction of susceptible uh, people at a given time. And DI by DT is the rate at which the I pool is changing at any given time with respect to time. Uh, so it's R0, the fraction of S uh, that are there in the population at a given time, minus 1 times gamma times I. Gamma, of course, can also be thought of, 1 over gamma can be thought of as the recovery time. So we'll have uh, a few things to say in a minute. Uh, because you can see even with this equation that a lot is going to depend on the gamma. How you estimate gamma is going to change your um, R naught. So that is one of the sources of uncertainty, error, if you like, in your computation of R0. And so we'll uh, try to manage that a little. Okay. So this is the key equation for us, uh, the DI by DT, that we're going to work with. And... Uh, Two out of the three methods that I'm going to show you now will actually be based on this one uh, equation. Uh, so let's let's look at these some of these methods. Now there's a lot of methods for estimating R zero, and when I say estimating R zero, I really mean to say estimation. I don't really I don't mean to say I want to get an accurate value of R zero. I want to say that I'd like to be able to get an estimate of R zero, which um, you know which gets in the right ballpark. Uh, because, you know, there's going to be many, many sources of error in computing R0. Now, I might mention one thing that I forgot to mention earlier in the SIR model, which is to say that this model is assuming a well-mixed population, which is a very bad thing to actually uh, incorporate uh, in your model. Now, let's see why that is a good thing and why that is a bad thing. See, it's a good thing because it makes the models somewhat simpler to work with. And it is actually uh, borne out by experience that we know that ODE models, ordinary differential equation models, the ones that we have to know here, these equations can actually do a good job of modeling uh, an epidemic to the extent that we have to find the right compartments that we want to include in our model. So oftentimes, uh, for COVID, people use SEIR models and SIQR uh, models, okay, and and some other kinds of models as well, right? But the point that I'm trying to make is that this is an ODE model. There is no sense of space in this. So, in particular, the networks by which uh, the virus spreads, the infection spreads, are not considered in these. models. Right, so that is just something to uh, keep in mind as we go through these models. That is, that is not to say that you know only network models can be useful, uh, only agent-based models can be useful. Uh, ODE models of these of this type are a mainstay of epidemiology. They are known to be they know they are known to work very well. And like I said uh, the last time as well, uh, some of the most important insights that we are looking to get. Uh, are actually borne out by these. So keep that in mind as you go through the data analysis. As we go through the data analysis, ask yourself the question, do I need space in order to explain uh, the data or am I going to be able to do it with the, um, the R0 calculated or derived from a compartmental model? That's something very interesting uh, to watch out for. So we will get to that when we uh, go on and do some calculations. Okay, so now uh, there are many methods for calculating R0. I'm going to talk about three methods, the first two of which we've seen a lot of in the COVID uh, pandemic uh, discussion. So there's a lot of discussion on what's that called the doubling time, so to speak, of the, um, of the case incidence rates, uh, case incidence times series. Uh, there are also exponential fits that we've seen. So we'll talk about these. And then towards the end, I will give you a sense of, you know, some of the other models that people have used, other methods that people have used for calculating R0 and so on. And I will also talk to you about a third method called the attack rate method, attack rate method, which we alluded to the last time, but then we will see some consequences of that uh, <clears throat> towards the end of this talk as well. Okay, so let's take a look at the doubling time. So look at this equation. This is the equation for the di by dt. Uh, and now this r0, for this method and for the next uh, method, the r0 is going to be computed at the beginning of a pandemic. You're going to take 
cases as they are reported in the newspaper and we're going to use that in order to estimate r0 the third method is going to compute r0 at the end of the epidemic okay and we'll see why that could be uh, useful also so these two methods the doubling time method and the exponential fit these are all these are both two sides of the same coin it will just be the same equation but just written in two different ways and we will uh, you, you use the cases and incidence data uh, in order to uh, calculate r0 from this and these are typically useful at the beginning of the epidemic where do we embed this assumption that this is being done at the beginning of an epidemic but here it is if the entire population is susceptible now we know for covid this is a novel coronavirus so the population has never seen this before so none of us have any antibodies to it this is the beginning of the epidemic and therefore these the pool the susceptible pool is the entire population okay. uh, that's not to say that people are equally susceptible to fatality it's who will get infected that's the important bit to remember over here so s corresponds uh, to the people who are susceptible to infection this is not this is not to do with fatality this is to do with who gets infected now the number of people who get infected and the number of people who uh, die do not survive it are two different things and i'd like you to be um, to be mindful of that so in the sir model remember that r includes both the recovered people and the removed people the people who succumb to the infection uh, the S model, uh, the S population of people who are susceptible and therefore at the beginning of the novel coronavirus, everybody is susceptible. Therefore, S can be usefully written as essentially N. So I'm going to make the approximation that S is approximately equal to N. If you do that, then notice that S over N in the DI by DT equation is approximately 1. Okay. If this is equal to 1, that's pretty much out of the picture. So DI by DT is R0 minus 1 times gamma times i and that's just um, a linear differential equation and so you can solve it the solution for those of you who remember it is an exponential for those of you who don't remember it i've written out the solution over here at any given time in the beginning of the epidemic you start with a few uh, case imported cases the people who have introduced who are introduced in the population having the disease and then it grows as exponential gamma times r0 minus 1 which is essentially the factor here uh, multiplying the i equation right and times t so we, this is the basic equation that we're going to carry with us this is i of t is i0 times an exponential where gamma times r0 minus 1 is going to be our uh, exponent of the exponential growth okay so uh, another way to write this equation down or look at or to look at this equation is to ask um, well, this is a feature of essentially exponentials. You can ask how long does it take for i t to be twice of i zero, and you can start with any i zero. This is not. This doesn't have to be at the very beginning. Time t is equal to zero. You can start at time t is equal to four and say, well, let's me ask how long will it take for the number of people at time is equal to four to become double. Okay, and then i t by i zero is essentially two because I'm just looking for doubling, uh, and um, I leave it as a exercise, it's a very small piece of algebra to show that R0 by rearranging this equation where it uh, by I0 is 2 can simply be written down as R0 is equal to 1 plus d log 2 of td. td being the doubling time, the time it takes from uh, between going from it is equal to twice of I, uh, I0. Okay? And d is simply 1 over gamma. So d is the duration of the infectious period. And D is the initial doubling time. By initial, I mean any time during the first early phase of exponential, the time that it takes to double. Okay, so we will look in the data uh, to see if we can estimate what this uh, is. Okay, so let's take a f let's let's develop some intuition to see what the uh, what kind of numbers are we uh, hoping to see over here. Uh, so you know the WHO in February 2020 put out some. Uh, advisory where it described the infection uh, using preliminary data the median time from onset to clinical recovery for mild cases is approximately uh, two weeks and then they say some uh, things about uh, the severe disease uh, and uh, so on and so forth okay so this number has canonically become starting has become about seven to ten days for a mild case of the infection 
it usually takes about a week or so, a week or a little more, one, one and a half weeks for uh, a person to start recovery. So in our simulation, we can take D to be about seven to 10 days okay, for the mild version of the uh, disease. Okay, so now for, since COVID for the most part is going to be, uh, you know, for a large population, a fraction of the population, it's going to present itself mildly. Uh, recovery time would be taken around seven to ten days. So, as an approximation, we take D as an estimate. We take D to be about seven to ten days for this uh, for this uh, for COVID. So, if T D were two days, then R zero can be calculated to be about three point four to four point four, right? And th that's just this equation over here. And I'm just putting numbers in. I have a sense of what D should be about seven to ten days. If I just put in uh, I have a doubling time. I can calculate some of these numbers, right? I can calculate it. What would happen if R zero is three? If see if the doubling time is three days, four days, seven days, and uh, R zero, uh, you know, only if R zero is about seven days, then uh, so if TD is about seven days, R zero is on the order of about one point seven to two. So what you expect to see is a doubling time of incidence cases anywhere between two days to three, four, even seven. Okay, so let's take a look at the data and see what you might, uh, what, what you expect to see over here in the data itself. Okay, so I downloaded the data. There's many sites that, um, that give you incidence data sets now. Mm, Johns Hopkins has a very good uh, site. I believe Worldometer has a very good site. Uh, I got some data from uh, humandata.org. And so let me now try to share my screen. Uh, so that you can follow me as I watch the uh, doubling times in the data. So I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to share my entire desktop if that helps. Uh, okay. So can everyone see uh, a table, an Excel sheet that I've pulled up? Chavi, yes. are you able to see my desk, my screen? Uh, yes, I can see the Excel Okay, screen. great. So at any point, if you can't see it, please let me know. Sure. Okay, so these are the case incidence rate case, uh, cases on first on 22nd January, there were no case uh, and so on and so forth. There was something that appeared on the 31st of January. There were two cases that were seen. And then uh, you can see that, you know, it takes a long time for the cases to start building up. But then suddenly uh, around the 21st of February, you start to see 20 cases. Okay. And if you ask how long will it take for 20 to become 40, well, that took place in just one day. Okay. So it happened very rapidly. Uh, let's step away from, uh, from the very early uh, numbers of cases. And let's take a look at, for example, line 35. This is on 25th of February. There were 322 cases. And then let's look down to see at what point, how many days later would the cases be double of this? So 644 cases. Well, in two days, the cases have become 655. So, it's, so essentially the doubling time here is about uh, two days. So if TD is two days, if we look up this chart that we put up, uh, if, the, if the doubling time is about two days, R0 is as high as about 3.5 to 4.5. That's a really high R0 uh, for this disease. Okay. Now let's look a little bit uh, further down. Uh, you might say that, you know, uh, these numbers are small enough that uh, we don't fully appreciate whether there are errors in our calculation and so on. Uh, let's take a look at, for example, uh, a little bit later, uh, 2000 cases. And let's ask how long does it get, uh, take to become about three, uh, uh, sorry, 4000 cases. And somewhere along the line, about three days or so, the numbers have doubled to 4,000 cases. So three days doubling time, the R0 is between 2.6 and 3.3, okay? Now, the so this range comes from assuming D is uh, seven days on the lower side and 10 days on the higher side, okay? So you sort of have an average R0 of about three over here, 
Okay, so I'd like you to remember that as we go ahead, and you can do this again and again. And you'll, if you can, ask, if you want, wish to ask, you know, how long does it take to get from about six thousand cases to about twelve thousand cases? Twelve thousand cases is over here, so that's about one, two, three, four, four days. It's taking about four days. If you as, if you look at the table for four days, the R zero is again about two and a half or so. Okay, so. Uh, <clears throat> So that shows us that you know you noting the doubling time, whether it's taking place on two day time, uh, two day doubling time, or a four day doubling time. The R zero is high; it's on the order of about two to and a half, uh, at least two and a half, if not even higher. And those are the kinds of estimates you get from uh, looking at the doubling time. Okay, so you can simply look at the doubling time, and you can get an estimate of the R zero. What if we can do better? So we will try and do better. Let's do. Uh, so when I say better, I mean the following: that uh, you know there is a certain granularity to it because uh, I'm not able to get numbers. Like for example, 5,883 was the exact double of it. I would have to double this number exactly, but that's not the granularity at which I can look in the data. So I won't know exactly whether it's three days or four days or 3.5 days or 3.4 days and so on. So there's a granularity of about a day, and you know having just a granularity of a, a day in your doubling time uh, actually causes uh, an error, substantial error in calculating the R zero. You can do things that are more sophisticated. You can have a sliding window. You can get a you, you can move your window, calculate you know, the doubling days for many of these, and take an average and pool it together, and so on and so forth. Uh, sure, you can do all of the things. You might get a slightly better uh, estimate of R zero. And those who are uh, those who do this professionally, those who know some of the influences on R zero, that uh, some of the things that can affect your calculation, know how to do this more properly, and then they can build some more um, uh, statistical, uh, statistically robust method like a confidence interval and so on. So that's the uh, next level of sophistication where one leads to with these kinds of methods. But let's not. Get too deep into that. Uh, let's uh, talk about simply an exponential fit. So recall that S is approximately n in the beginning of the epidemic, and I of t is going to grow exponentially with an exponent that's gamma times r zero minus one. So that if I can fit the incident data, uh, incidence data, that means i changing with time, with some exponential fit. Then I'll be able to recover the exponent, this exponent over here, and from this exponent, in my estimate of gamma, I'll be able to recover R zero. So let's try and do that. I will take. Uh, so my equation will simply be R zero will be whatever my exponent, uh, I the slope, I get uh, what my exponent uh, in the exponential. V that I get, it will be that divided by gamma plus one. We'll do this in a minute, so it'll be complete. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to now pull up this uh, data, and I'd like you to follow along to see how I'm going to do this. Uh, it's going to be pretty straightforward. I'm simply going to grab this data, import it into MATLAB because that's my favorite uh, tool to use. But you can use any other package that you like. All we're going to do is plot an, you know, fit an exponent. Right. So I'm just going to use MATLAB. Uh, you're welcome to use anything else. Uh, okay, so I have my uh, data set imported, and if anyone's interested, you know, uh, please ask a question, and I'll show you exactly how to import stuff and so on. I have it set up so that uh, I can go ahead and import this uh, selection. That's my case incidence data, uh, and there is a vector that's created called uh, Italy cases. Uh, let's quickly plot this data. So, you, one of the things, one of the reasons I like this data set is because it sort of gives you day by day uh, the 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 numbers every day. So uh, the the uh, nodes are exactly one day apart. So, okay. Uh, Chabi, can you see this plot that uh, came up on the screen? Yes, doctor. With, uh, great. So that's the rate at which uh, the cases are growing, uh, in uh, were growing, uh, and we can always go back into our 
table to see on which day uh, how many uh, cases were found uh, and this is this you know discard chart victory uh, one thing i should uh, i went in and looked uh, the total population is around uh, 60 million of italy and the lockdown date was on 9th march so if i look in my table 9th march is around here this is 9th march so around 10000 cases when they saw that the numbers were going to cross 10000 is pretty much when they did their lockdown that may have been the reason uh, that they carried out the lockdown on 9th march uh, okay so number changes between 9172 to something about uh, 10000 so that's uh, the 10000 mark is essentially uh, what where the numbers have changed and 10000 is going to uh, come up over here uh, don't be fooled by the uh, by the 0 0.51 1.5 there's a factor of 10 to the 5 that's hidden over here i hope you can see that on your screens right so this number 10000 lies somewhere over here we'll see we'll zoom on that in a minute and we'll see it so i'm going to use a package called cf tool uh, sorry um, a built-in command inside uh, matlab to call cf tool to fit it here's what i'm trying to do i so there are zero cases over here and at some point these numbers are growing exponentially right that's the bit i want to try and fit i'm going to try and fit this data with an exponential fit uh, later on of course you know it has curved around in the in the data i mean the data started to slope downwards uh, so this is no longer going to be an exponential fit this is the bit where i'm going to try and fit an exponential curve over here in particular before 10000 i would like to ask whether the numbers below 10000 actually fit an exponential or not so my next set of experiments is to uh, try and see if that is any good so i'm starting cf tool cf tool is the uh, is the command which allows me to do some uh, fitting i'm going to pick out my y data to be italy cases and as i said uh, <clears throat> the data is all uh, uniformly distributed day by day so it won't uh, so you know i don't really have to pick any x data but if there were changes in the x data then i should have uh, you know if the day was not uniformly spaced then i should have uh, i would have picked another vector for x data okay that's just some uh, at the moment, don't worry about this fit that's showing up. Let's look at uh, an exponential fit. So an exponential fit actually does quite bad, right? You see that the whole thing, you know, if you, if you try to fit the exponential, but you get this blue line, which is not terribly great. I mean, it doesn't look like an exponential fit to me at all. But so what, here's what we're going to do. Uh, we are going to do a fit, not to the whole data, but I'm going to do a fit to only a part of the data and in particular i want to fit data only to uh, the first 10000 so to speak so i'm going to exclude anything that's less than say 10 because i would i don't want to include zero I, i'd rather have some uh, you know reasonable numbers to include you can start with one if you like and uh, i'll say take the first uh, 10 to 100 uh, data points okay so i'm going, I'm, going I'm using this uh, now, so there's a very few numbers that have been fit. There are actually quite a few human beings here. There are between 10 uh, cases that are fit, but it's a very tiny thing over here and you can't really see it. So I'm going to zoom in on that. So the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to change my axis limits to be between, mm, I'm sorry, that was excluded by, oh, here it is. I'm going to change this number to be no more than uh, 200. Say. And this will be zero. Okay, so now you can somewhat see, you can see this more carefully. If I look at the first hundred cases, up to the first hundred cases, then those are the cases that we've seen, and you can see that it fits an exponential. Let's look at some of the parameters of the exponential. Well, parameter B is uh, 1.131. Okay, so remember my uh, rule. Uh, so it's 1.131 uh, divided by 0.1 plus 1. Okay, uh, <clears throat> sorry, now multiplied by, uh, sorry, let me get that right for a minute. 
it was oops so it's 1.13 and switch so you know you get a very bad number uh, for this you get actually 12 which is terribly high so if you use a very small amount of data to by, by high i mean we know that the estimates for corona are on the order of 1.5 to 3.5 okay number of studies have shown this so by that count i say uh, it this is uh, not a good uh, estimate okay but if you had only that much data that would be your best estimate so let's take a big bit uh, larger portion of the data in our data set let me take the first 1000 by first i mean from 10 to 1000 uh, cases and then let's try and fit it so now i get a number with an exponent of 0.36 okay. so if i do uh, 0.36 i will get about 4.6 for my r0 4.6 is on the order of uh, the r0 that people had believed the coronavirus had in the beginning okay so your estimate changes in fact with the number of patients you see uh, remember this is the estimate it's not the r0 itself that's changing it's your estimate of how you fit your data uh, and that actually uh, how you discover the data and how you fit it that actually that estimate actually changes by how robust the fit is okay so that's about uh, that now uh, let me do one other calculation which is to say if i did not take 10 days as my uh, period of infectivity if i had taken about 7 and my b was 0.36 okay so i'm going to change this to 0.36 then my uh, then my r0 is on the order of of about 3.5 if i take 10 it's on the order of about 4.6 so uh, there's quite a bit of difference uh, depending on what your um, uh, or what your gamma is your infectivity period and that actually makes sense too another thing that i want you to notice if i can go back to the fitting tool is that the r square is actually very high it's 0.99 so the exponential fit is really really good and why is the exponential fit really really good well the exponential fit is really really good because in the beginning the number of susceptible people is changing so little that s by n is nearly 1 right there's so few cases this is this view point that we have over here is such a zoomed view of the of the pandemic whereas the number of the total number of people is really really high it's 60 million people and we're looking at you know hundreds and thousands of patients so we're looking at a very small fraction of the population being infected which means s is very close to n now this is this situation is completely different if there was if you were close to herd immunity if you were close to herd immunity the uh, with an r0 of uh, of 2 uh, you know you would find that s is on the order of half half the population would be infected right so s would be completely different from one the fraction Uh, would be completely different from one. It's quite a bit different, right? And that will now start to influence your calculation of the R zero. But in the beginning, uh, your S is very nearly one, and therefore these exponential effects are uh, becoming so good. Okay, so let's continue our uh, our analysis, and let's go all the way up to the point where we assume that the lockdown took place. So I'm going to include uh, all the way to uh, 10,000, and I'm going to zoom my window to be somewhere around that actually let me zoom it out a little bit more uh, let's take okay so if you look at if you look at this is if you look at the data this is the position presumably where the lockdown took place that's this is on the 9th and this is a day uh, after that remember that i told you that reporting often becomes uh, you know you have to keep keep in mind how things are reported notice that on two successive days you have exactly the same number of uh, reported deaths right a reported cases i'm sorry uh, reported cases right? so that's probably something that one has to worry about 
from the point of view of logistics of reporting, it can't be that two days uh, you have exactly the same number of cases. Okay, so that's those are some of the bookkeeping things that one has to worry about. But look at the data; it fits so well by an exponential. The R squared is continued to be 0.99. It's so so good. This is so much of an exponential. You find that B has now on this larger data set is on the order of a 0.23. Okay, so if I take 0.23. And I recompute my I R zero. I get uh, an outer number of three point three, and a number of closer to two point six. So it's between two point six and three point three. It's still relatively high, uh, higher than two. It's on the order of about two point six to three point three. So it's on the order of about three. Uh, and then at that point, the Italian authorities decided that this uh, was going to blow up and uh, let's take a look at what the blow up would have looked like so all i need to do at that point is to extrapolate this blue curve farther out and see what the number of cases i expect to see uh, uh, see if no intervention is carried out okay so all i do in that case is to actually increase my viewport to uh, a larger window and let's try seeing it see this would have been the number had no lockdown occurred so you would have seen quite a few cases within about 10 to 15 days okay so this would have been quite a few uh, numbers and let's push out even more and so on and so forth and so forth so it was felt necessary that you know since such a large number of cases will appear uh, let's do a lockdown, which will try and reduce our R0. And you can start lowered as the lockdown proceeds. So uh, the effect of the lockdown is becomes visible within the next, uh, within a week to two weeks. And you can uh, start to see that the R0 has slowed down, uh, RT has slowed down uh, considerably. So I will show you the full thing. And there you go. Right? So this would have been had there been no lockdown and this is what it was uh, post lockdown. So that was one of the ways in which R0 was manipulated by the Italian authorities. And, if you, and I'll leave it as an exercise for you to try and calculate what the R0 would have been over here at 80 days, you know, about 25 days or 30 days into the lockdown. What would be the R0 over here? I'll leave it to you to calculate it. But remember, that you want to be mindful of how many susceptible people there are at say day 80. Are you going to be able to use the same approximation S is approximately N or not? That's one of the key questions that you have to ask yourself. Uh, which of these methods do you think, the exponential pit or a doubling time, which of these methods do you think will be more appropriate to calculating an R0 and RT at say day 80, day 100 and so on and so on. And then uh, I'd like you to try and run a simulation of this, if you uh, the full SIR model, uh, and see if you can uh, capture uh, this uh, trend uh, in your equations by manipulating the parameters appropriately. So I believe that is an exercise to you. Those are the kinds of questions that uh, professional epidemiologists, uh, epidemic modelers spend a lot of time uh, working. So that's how you calculate R0 from incidence data. I'm going to switch now to my uh, final method for, for computing uh, R0s. And this is going to be a very different view of the epidemic. And this is to do with the attack rate. So remember the attack rate I said was, uh, so the attack rate uh, R infinity is, is after the epidemic has passed through, how many people have recovered? minus R infinity will be S infinity. That means how many people remain susceptible even after the entire epidemic is done. Remember we saw all of this the last time? So here it is. You, this was the attack rate equation uh, we wrote down uh, last time. And as an estimate of the numbers, if R0 is about two, R infinity is about 80%. So the susceptible population at the end of the epidemic for an R0 of two would be about 20%. And I'm being 
little bit fuzzy about whether or not RJ has been manipulated in an intervening period or not. But assuming that there is no Dr. intervention, Dr. Pranay, uh, I yes. will just interrupt. We could not, uh, I could not hear. Uh, I think the last one minute, uh, the voice was breaking. Could okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. So my final method for calculating the uh, R zero is to do with the attack rate. Uh, this is an equation that we developed the last time. R fin infinity stands for the number of people that are recovered in the R pool at the end of the epidemic, when the ep epidemic has passed through. And so one minus R infinity will be the number of people who are susceptible at the end of the uh, epidemic. That means a sufficient amount of time has passed through, I is nearly zero. Okay, and if you simply rearrange the attack rate equation, you can write down R zero in terms of S infinity. And I'd encourage you to do this calculation on your own. It's just a little bit of algebra, a little bit of manipulation, and you will find it in terms of the number of people that are that are left susceptible at the end of the epidemic. You can calculate an R zero from that quantity. So, how would you want to use this information? You would say, you know, what's the point of calculating an R zero when the epidemic is already over? When the epidemic just is gone through and um, a population, then why would you want to calculate? Well, two things. One, keep in mind that the estimates of R0 that you will see at the beginning of the epidemic and the R0 estimate that you will see at the end of the epidemic could be different. And this may be one of the reasons why uh, you will find that people who are calculating the R0 at the beginning tend to say now the R0 has been adjusted. Don't be in a hurry to, to attribute all of it to the lockdown. It is a matter of looking at the data to ask how much of it is attributable to the lockdown and how much as an aggregate uh, R0 was influenced when the ep epidemic was done. So when people do a post hoc calculation after the epidemic, you might actually see a number uh, that is different from the initial estimates. Okay. okay. And uh, so one might want to actually calculate R0 from an S infinity estimate for various reasons. One might want to say, well, you know, if I need to vaccinate a population, how much of the population should I vaccinate? If I allow for a certain fraction of the population to be susceptible, the remaining have been vaccinated, then what my R, what is my R0 that I can expect it to be? So by a comparative estimation of what my R0 is from the incidence cases versus uh, you know, how much of my population do I need to vaccinate? How much of the population can I afford to leave susceptible at the end of the uh, epidemic, there are that can inform a vaccination program. It can also inform a social distancing program. For example, uh, look at India's uh, look at the vulnerable population in the in COVID. The vulnerable population is above 65, and the, the truly vulnerable population is above 65, and those who are immune uh, compromised. So, if R zero is kept under two using physical distancing, for example, S infinity would be about 20 percent of the population. Would a 20% population remaining susceptible be, uh, is it possible to keep 20% 20, uh, 20 of the population on uh, this thing uh, susceptible? Because remember, if you're susceptible, you can catch the infection. Right? So one possibility is, which has been suggested, uh, is that India has a population which is only 6% above 65 years of age. Right? This is uh, according to a UN uh, data from 2019. So a 6% of the population, if those 6% of the vulnerable uh, portion of India's population were to be part of the 20% um, that would be S infinity, that would be the group S infinity. Perhaps we can take care of the epidemic without, uh, uh, without seeing fatalities as far as possible. So that is another kind of estimate that one might want to uh, make. So the tactic method also helps you uh, get these kinds of estimates uh, in place Put and, and put some uh, measures in place. So that, that's all I uh, want to say and I've run out of time. Uh, so I want to say, I want to close by saying that there are many, many methods and there are, uh, you know, this is a fully developed uh, branch of applied mathematics, of epidemiology and so on. And uh, some of the methods that we did not discuss, but if you're, you're very welcome and I encourage you to uh, delve into these, uh, we, there can be stochastic versions of these equations. They can be uh, stochastic versions of the quantities, uh, the statistical estimates themselves. I already mentioned that there could be alternate uh, deterministic 
uh, models that one could use and that would change some of the definitions uh, slightly and then that would change uh, reproduction of numbers the way they're calculated uh, somewhat. There is a method called the next generation matrix. A lot of professional epidemiologists uh, and physio uh, epidemiology modelers use the next generation matrix. We did not get into that here. There are Bayesian inference methods, and some researchers have written influential papers, uh, uh, including the group at Oxford uh, with Sunetra Gupta and uh, Carson Chow at NIH, who've done, uh, who use Bayesian inference methods for uh, COVID modeling. And uh, you're welcome to see those papers if, you, if this interests you. Uh, and one final thought is that infectious diseases present themselves in very, very different ways. Coronaviruses are different from HIV and so on and so forth. And some methods might be more appropriate than others in a given context. You've already seen some examples where, uh, a part of the examples where, you know, it was useful in the beginning to calculate R0 at the beginning of the epidemic. And then there are some estimates of R0 that are carried out at the end of the uh, epidemic. So those are all uh, food for thought. Uh, I'm going to leave a few references. Uh, I'm going to point to uh, some very influential papers in this field. Uh, this is a book, uh, Mathematical Models in Biology. It's a Bible for those who practice uh, mathematical uh, modeling uh, by Professor Lear Edelstein Keshet. Uh, it's a science classic in applied mathematics. That's a very good book to read some of these topics from as well. Uh, there's, a, there's a very influential paper by Pauline Vanden Triesch, uh, which would be a very good paper to get into. Uh, there's some famous and classical papers, uh, these next two. Uh, a lot of work is done by uh, Anderson and May in these uh, modeling studies. And this last one I put up over here, because this is one of the finest examples I know of modeling uh, these questions uh, in, in the it Italy context. Uh, Morden Peterson and Matteo Mahanagini uh, have been writing a series of papers and they've done, done some very, very good uh, fitting of the data and uh, using in particular something called the uh, <clears throat> SIQR model, which they found was most suited with quarantine. Okay. And so if anybody is interested, I encourage you to go into their papers and you will see uh, really good fits, really good estimates of the quantities of the types that we've been talking about. So that's all I have and uh, thank you. And I hope uh, you found it somewhat useful. Thank you, Dr. Prane. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions. So I'll okay. take a couple of quick ones. Sure. Uh, one is, uh, uh, can we accurately calculate the exact duration of an epidemic by using doubling method? Um, not by using the doubling method per se. See, remember the doubling method will actually give you a sense of the RT at that moment. But to be able to forecast, you need to know a lot many other things. You need to know, uh, for example, what is the size of the susceptible population? How you, you need to develop an evolution equation for what your model of how these things will progress is. You, uh, uh, and so, yes, you know, if you do it in, in the context of a compartmental model, yes, your doubling method will be uh, useful to calibrate your model and then make a prediction. I hope that explains it. Yeah, I, I think that makes it clearer. Uh, one last question, and that is, uh, if I'm a healthcare worker, uh, how uh, should I use the, these mathematical models and the ground level data to, uh, in that, how would it influence my work in terms of uh, providing for beds, uh, looking at hospitalizations? How does the work of healthcare workers get affected? Right. So uh, I've tried to make these points uh, all along the presentation. Uh, it affects how one proceeds with vaccinations. But for, unfortunately for COVID, we don't have vaccinations. So I will, uh, so at this point, it influences our social distancing uh, programs in the sense that if we can, if we use some of these models, you, if, for example, we know that the R0 is between 1.5 and uh, 2.5, then looking at the demography of India, it makes it important that uh, the over 65 people are extra well protected because you would like them to be in the 
protected pool and the susceptible pool, less infinity pool after the epidemic is done. So I think that's one way in which you can use it most directly. But there's a lot of uh, you know small uh, considerations that go into these things. So at a broad level, I can say this, but uh, yes, uh, I mean social distancing or uh, physical distancing is one of the out one of the insights that you derive from this, and uh, demographically to protect the elderly. All right. So th thank you, Dr. Pranay. Many thanks. I think uh, looking at uh, this from the real data perspective uh, really gives the students a good way to analyze. And also uh, you ask them a lot of questions, so I'm sure they can play around. So Sounds thanks good. for enabling our viewers to use a more hands-on process to understand the ongoing pandemic. I think it's been really valuable. Great. I'm glad it helped. Tom. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, and like uh, always, uh, I'm sure our participants learned a lot. I would like to mention that all the participants will be receiving a feedback form via email. And uh, please do remember to fill this out and uh, send it back to us. Um, also, this is, uh, this is an informative webinar, so, uh, webinar series. So it will not be possible for us to send out certificates of participation. I would like to take a minute here to thank the continuing efforts of the Manav Outreach team for organizing the data science webinar series. So keep watching uh, the Twitter, Facebook, and all other social media handles of Manav for the announcements about our upcoming talks. Once again, on behalf of the entire Manav team, I thank Dr. Prani Goyal for two very interesting talks. And thank thanks you. everyone for joining us. See you all next time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.